Hello, welcome to the Last Tackle podcast here on loverugbyleague.com, the ultimate home of everything rugby league on the web. I'm James Gordon, joined as ever by Drew Dabshire, and this week in the hot seat we've got Ian Smith. Ian, thanks for taking your time out of your busy schedule. Ian's off to do an offload session I am as part of your state of mind work, so nice, convenient. We will interview someone whose surname isn't Smith at some (laughs) point. Um, but yeah, thanks for uh, for coming along in. Please do subscribe to the YouTube channel, leave your comments um, as well. Let us know what you think of anything Ian says as well. Don't be too abusive, though. Um, <laughs> can we just start? We'll just look at uh, last weekend's start of the Super League season because there's a few things I want to talk to Ian about in particular. We'll start Wigan, Wigan against Warrington. Um, Drew, you covered the game for Love Rugby League. Um, a win for Wigan, but I suppose there was no losers, if you like, on the night because Warrington did get a bit of raps for the way they played with, with 12 men. Well, no, I actually thought Warrington were the better team uh, on Thursday night and I thought they, they would have won had Chris Hill uh, not been dismissed early doors. It was a, a sending off ball, let's face it. He, he knocked Sam Powell out uh, for a couple of minutes be, before he was taken off the field. Sam Powell, uh, 50-50 for this week still um, with his concussion protocol still to, mm. to take place. Uh, I was really impressed with Warrington. I think they've un- unearthed uh, a gem in Matty Ashton who, who was uh, a, a star at Swinton in the Championship last season. Um, but the, the really promising signs for, for Warrington. I was a, a little bit disappointed with Wigan that they just continued to, to take it through the middle. I don't think they, they shipped it to the centres and wingers enough uh, and stretched Warrington. Uh, but, but at the end of the day they got the job done. Uh, two points for for the Cherry and Whites, and, and let's let's uh, look at the positives from Wigan's point of view. Like this time last year, they were on minus two, um, and now they're on two points. So uh, it's good signs for and promising signs for both teams. Yeah, I think. I mean, I said this to Steve Price yesterday at at their press conference. It's like as much as they're getting good raps, they still lost. And mm. I suppose as much as people might say Wigan struggled, they still won. Yeah. You know, so it, it's one of them. No complaints for the Reddy and Chris oh, Hill. Oh no. No, I think it was, it was a, a, a straight red, direct contact uh, to a player uh, who's going over to score a try. So, a clear penalty try. Uh, and, and, a, and to be honest, I thought it were a grade C. You know, when I saw it, I thought he'll get a grade C and, and a grade C is about right. Three matches. Uh, he won't have an EGP, so I assume he's, he's no, not going to appeal. Not appeal. No, they're, they're, they're just going to accept it. People say, what else can he do? A player's going over, but you can't. Swipe yeah. somebody around the chops. Well, that's it, I suppose. Is that a difficult sometimes to, when there's no malice? There was no, no malice in the tackle, no. but ultimately, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, well, you've got accidental, deliberate or reckless, you know, and it, it came in the reckless. You yeah. know, it clearly weren't deliberate, but it, it comes on the reckless, and a reckless talent challenge like that is a grade C all day long, and quite rightly, a penalty try. One or two people, especially on social media, said that, you know, the, the video ref bailed him out because it took so long before the referee sent him off. But at that moment in time, the paramount importance is a player getting treatment. Mm. Why rush Why rush it? Why say, right, Chris, you're off. Mm. Let everything calm down. Get the information from the, the, the video ref. Your heart, his heart rate will be going at that moment in time. First, you know, for Chris Kendall. First game of the season, you know, emotions are running high and there's a potential to send somebody off which has a massive impact on the game. Because, yeah, Warrington, I thought, was with 30 men would have probably won that game but they didn't so for the referee it's a massive decision so take your time get the information from the video ref collect your thoughts and then quite correctly are sending off is it, it is important to take that stock as a referee because you don't always get that time do you it's easy to yeah. I mean you see it more in football where the red card comes out straight yeah. away don't you how important is it to, to take that step back and almost collect your thoughts before making such a big decision very much so because, uh, like I said, when you see an incident like that, your heart rate is really incredibly high to start with, but then, boom, it goes to another level. And sometimes when your heart rate goes to that another level and the adrenaline kicks in even more, it's just about deep breaths, gather your thoughts, get back in the room, so to speak, and then you can make a rational decision based on the correct information, either from your touch judges, from your video ref, or what you, you've clearly seen. Mm. You know, so it is important that you take as much time as you need. How much of an impact does the screen have on on what you're doing for them TV, you know, for what the referees do on the TV games? Because, you know, I presume it's a completely different environment doing a a TV game than it is doing a non-TV game because I suppose once once the incident's happened and it's not on TV, no one can see it again. No, no. Well, the the big screen for the referee is immaterial. 
You know, yeah. don't look at it. Yeah. The, the, you're right. Because there is a big screen, clearly then there is a video ref. And now uh, the video ref can give input to, mm. to the referee regarding foul play. They couldn't when I was a referee. Right. That's something that's been brought in over the last four, possibly mm. five years now, where the, the video ref can look at an incident uh, in all its replays and then say to the referee, right, in my opinion, uh, Chris Hill, in, for instance, has hit Sam Pell, direct contact to the head, mm. It's a red card for me. If the if the referee who has ultimate charge, he says no. I think first contact on the shoulder. He he doesn't have to go with the video ref. But to be honest, with all the replays that they have and the amount of time, you'd be I won't say you'd be daft. Yeah. But you've got to be really strong in your conviction to go against what a video ref will give you. And I suppose replays. you've got you've got all the fans up in arms because they you know especially yeah. the whole, if it's against the home team yeah. or whatever they can see it. And I mean, how difficult is it to not if, if when you were a referee to not look at the screen? Uh, uh, never did. But do you, do you, was it not? Was it really hard to fight that urge to? to um, oh, when when I say I never did, there's times where like you're giving a penalty signal and the screen's in the corner and you you think you're checking your air. You know, you, you just, well, you just say, Oof, you know, yeah. especially when the crowd go up. Yeah. And you have players that are scrum down. If you give if you give a, a knock on and they think it's wrong, they'll be saying, "Look at the screen." Yeah. Don't want to look at the screen. Yeah. You know, let's get let's get on with it. You know, and some of that's a little bit kidology. You know, the older players uh, be saying, "Hey, Ian, have a look at the screen. Yeah. You got that wrong. You got that wrong." You know, even though you might not have done. You know, and sometimes in your ear, your video ref will just say, "Take me notice. You got that right." <laughs> Maybe not in my case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one other incident before we move on from the Warrington Wigan game was this charge down. Now I really like engaging with you on Twitter, Ian, and and if you've not got Ian on Twitter, he's great to have. Um, <laughs> So this, the charge down incident, I think it was Jason Clark had come through and he'd sort of, it was last tackle and he just sort of kicked it. Full back stuck it. his hand out, it's hit his hand, yeah. it's gone down. Yeah. You know, I, well, it, it wasn't a knock on, it was a charge down, but obviously people thought it was a knock on. Mm. I, I mean, I must admit, my understand, well, I just thought knock on as soon as I seen it. But you, can you just clarify what the, why it wasn't a knock on and why a charge down was the correct decision? Yeah, a, a charge down is where. Um, it's a kick from a rising ball. So if, if I kick the ball two inches off the ground and the ball is rising, it doesn't have to be up here. Mm. As long as the ball is rising and you put your hand out or your arms out uh, or any part of your body and block, the, but obviously a knock on is from the yeah, other yeah, arms. Yeah. But if you put your hand out, as long as the ball is rising and it it's your hand and goes forward, well, yeah, it goes forward, it's a charge down. Mm. You know, people say, well, he was playing at it. But to be honest, if you was running at me and kicked the ball and I run forward and put my hand out, yeah, I'm playing still at playing it. at yeah. it. I'm still coming forward. It, there's nothing to do with coming forward or playing at it. it it's all about the angle of the ball. Mm. So the ball has to be rising. Once it's reached its peak and it's on its way down, then it becomes a knock-on. Having said that, sometimes over that distance, it's so difficult. If the referee had given a knock-on, he'd have probably got away with it in review yeah. because it was so close. Everybody would have accepted it. However... In law, he got it right because mm. it was a kick that was rising uh, and the player, he can play at it because it's from a rising ball, so that constitutes a charge down. And it must be so difficult to make those decisions in that split second because, like you know, like I was saying, if it was a dummy half passing from the floor and a, and a mm. player's put his hand yeah. out, it's a knock-on. It is. It's almost like the exact same action but from yeah. a pass instead of a kick. Absolutely. But, but it must be so difficult to... But you just hit the nail and the yeah, one's a pass. I yeah. think somebody on Twitter said, well, if I pass the ball from the ground and it's rising, then he can knock it down. No, yeah. that's a pass. Yeah. A charge down has to be from a kick where the ball is rising. Mm. Uh, and it's cl- clear in the rules because I actually... Yeah, you just the, the well, that's right. Like I say that you're you're like the oracle on Twitter on match <laughs> I'm not days. Quite sure the oracle's <laughs> the right word, but uh, you know I I always have a rule book next to me. You know, I've case. got my remote control of my rule book <laughs> because a lot of time it, it's it's not that fans get it wrong by choice. They just don't always know the rules. The, yeah. the rules, are but there's complex. so many, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's so many, and then there's little policies that come out. Obviously, now with the new play the ball rules yeah. about being off balance and playing and making an attempt with your foot, and you know they can't make a new booklet every time for the new rules. So they they have a policy document and guidelines for each season where they where they change it, and it, it's it's up to obviously the practitioners, the referees to understand it and the players. But the fans, they don't. They just see it in its big entirety. And that looked all day long to be a knock-on. Mm. However, in fine detail, by the law, which which that's not a new law, that's probably 1895 yeah. law, it's a charge down and, and the ref were, was quite correct. 
And again, you said, how do they get that? Sometimes it's gut feeling, sometimes it's being in the right position, and sometimes it's a bit of luck, mm. or not, depending mm. on whether you get it right or not. <laughs> how, how hard is it for you on a match day when you see people giving the ref abuse, obviously knowing from yourself being in that position? Um, I feel sorry for the refs. Uh, you know, I just think, you know, especially now with what I do with state of mind and, and how prevalent, you know, mental health, how important it is. You know, because everything's always been, it's an alpha male sport, it's aggressive, it's very physical and this and the other, but it's also very emotional and very very mentally taxing. Uh, and again, what I do with state of mind, with how important mental health is and physical health, you know, that level of abuse and that level of negativity does have an impact. For some, it's massive. For some, they might brush it off. Mm. And great, mm. you know, but... The difference between mental health and physical health, it's not one size fits all. Yeah. Some things really upset some people, some things it just goes washing straight off them. You know, and, and I love a debate on rugby league. You know, I could talk about it all day, uh, which generally I do. Uh, and I love it. Most people say, well, you're taking the passion out of it if you can't shout to the ref. No, you by all means shout um, at the ref, but not to the ref, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, don't. Don't, don't, abuse, don't, don't, don't call abuse, him or whatever. Don't yeah. call him. You know, but oh, come on, referee, what on earth have you given that for? But not you yeah, yeah. effing whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. And it's always that but that comes on the end of it that it's just daft. Enjoy yeah. the game. Don't make the referee the centrepiece of, of all the negativity and all, everything that's wrong with the game always seems to end up at the referee's door. Mm. It's not right. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about uh, State of Mind in a little bit. So the other games at the weekend, we saw Hull KR um, surprisingly beat Wakefield Drew, you think? 30-12? You, you, well, in I, fact, you tipped I, it. I, I tipped in fact, in fact, in fact I'll yeah, have to yeah. mention this now. Is Drew, he the Drew is the current leader in the me- joint leader in the media tipping league. Yeah, he got eight, a that, score of eight. I, got, well, I, only got one, I only got one game wrong, which were obviously... Catalans. I Catalans and beat Huddersfield. Yeah. But, um, I, yeah, I thought... Old Carol, obviously, with, with what's gone on in recent weeks, I think they'd want to play for Mossy Masso and want to put a good performance in for the fans. Uh, they certainly did that. I don't think we were quite expecting that scoreline from from Old Carol. That was quite impressive. Ben Crooks on four fire, tries. Uh, four tries for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Wakefield could could be in for a, a rocky road this year. Uh, I think they could they could struggle. Well, Danny Bruff got his ace. Well, it was a suspected ACL. We don't think it's as bad so as they that. For two to three weeks. Yeah, so know, that that, that was lucky because uh, you'd imagine if they'd have lost him, yeah. you know, they'd have been looking. Did, did David Fafita play? I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah because he, he's. You know, he's a massive catalyst for everything they yeah. do going forward, don't they? I think they're uh, wait for the one of them teams, and there's a couple of teams that are in this boat that if they can stay injury free, they could finish however hard they want. But if they get a couple of injuries, you can sort of I see think, them finishing. Yeah, and I, I think they're just they're lacking depth, aren't they? This year, wait for like well, the one to seventeen is pretty strong on paper, but it's um, when when them injuries do start to occur, and we 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 seen it last year with Trinity, they had a yeah. six or seven out towards the back end of the season, and they just. Uh, well, well, they were, they were in the relegation fight, weren't they, yeah. alongside London? Uh, I think they could be in, a, in for a tough year, but Hull KR, they're out, like, I think everyone in the media tippings has uh, predicted that Hull KR are go down. And, uh, Tony Smith will love that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, no, they will. I, they suppose, will. I mean, a bit like London last year, everyone had written them off, and obviously they just. <laughs> They just had an attitude where they almost had nothing to lose when they went into the game. Ten matches, and then they, well, and, and they took, and it wasn't that just the fact they won ten. They took it to the very last game mm. of the season, didn't they? And I mean, if we could have that every year, we'd be laughing. Uh, other results: Saint Helens forty-eight, Salford eight in a repeat of last season's grand final. Um, Toronto's first Super League game ended in defeat. They lost twenty-eight ten to Castleford. Um, we mentioned Catalan lost thirty-two twelve to Huddersfield. I was actually one of only six people to predict the Huddersfield win. I have to mention that. Um, and Aiden, then Aiden Caesar stole the show, didn't he? Well, by uh, all account, we I'm didn't not, watch not, it, of course, well, because well, obviously there's no TV yeah, deal. Catalans haven't got a TV deal this year. Which, Ian had to walk the dog on Saturday night. Uh, probably, it's that very was disappointing enough. to be fair that they've not got a TV deal, and we can't yeah. see teams playing Catalans because um, every, every fan wants to watch the, the club when they mm. when they go over there if they can't afford to go to over to Perpignan and uh, Israel Fellow started training with, uh, the with the Dragons yeah. uh, this morning right. um, and then the other game that we've not mentioned Hull 30 points to 4 winners at Leeds they were pretty impressive were, were Hull uh, I, well yeah I could come in yeah. I, I thought I thought they were tremendous mm. I thought they dominated every every facet of the game they were stronger they were quicker they had direction um, I thought Leeds were a little bit one dimensional a little bit of a scoop from dummy yeah. half running up out of blind alley 
and and the kick chase weren't great. But I think that come off the, the back. They were just back of a beaten pack. Mm. Mm. And they all look strong. Well, that's. A, I mean, you look at their outside backs are probably bigger than quite a few teams' packs. And no, they the, the very impressive, aren't they? I thought I was impressed with Manu Mao and uh, Ligi Sao for for Hull. I thought they did some damage through the middle, uh, but as you say, they're outside backs, they're formidable as well. You've got Maia Fanua, who's, <laughs> who could probably play in the front row, let's let's be honest. Yeah. Um, but I think with Leeds, in attack, they just didn't look like they had a plan B. Uh, that when the plan A weren't working, they just tried to throw the ball around and then they just end up knocking on and they come up with errors and I just didn't I didn't really like the structure of Leeds going forward and I just don't think it was working for them. It was probably the worst thing that could have happened to Leeds as well. I mean obviously defeat's always the worst thing that could happen, but because they're trying to get a new era going and a new direction and all that, you know, suffering such a heavy defeat, you know. And I, comparing the forward packs, I just I just, are Leeds big enough in the forwards? Well, especially when you, can, so. <laughs> when you compare it to old, definitely not. But I just think looking at Leeds' pack and what they've had in recent years, I just I, just, I thought it was a little bit light. But then, wouldn't it be the most whole thing ever if they lose this week in the derby against Hull KR? Well, yeah, and, and it, that's that's the big thing with Hull, isn't it? Because Hull KR has shut a lot of us up. Yeah, they, they, I mean, you, you look at Hull every year and you almost think you know they, they've got yeah. a good team, yeah. and then they, so that's a massive thing for Hull this season. Isn't it? Just trying to prove they can. Do it consistently week in, week out. It was interesting what Lee Radford said in an interview where he was talking about the hardest job for him at the moment is trying to find a place for the four or five mm. players who aren't in that, that 17. Because you know, there's nothing worse than when players aren't playing. Mm. You know, like for a referee, there was nothing worse than when you weren't in Super League, you were frustrated, mm. you were angry, you were, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then if you're not careful, that can create you know, a bit of unrest. Mm. So he's got to be really smart how he rotates his troops. And, uh, but well, it's a good problem to have. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Brian McDermott would like to have that problem, wouldn't he, at Toronto? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> um, in the Championship, there were wins on the opening day for Featherstone, London, Halifax, Widnes, Whitehaven, Swinton and Lee. Uh, Halifax actually scored last minute, Oliver Roberts. They beat Sheffield 18-17. So that was a... Uh, Oliver Roberts, I, actually, I think I text you, didn't I? Because I was thinking, Oliver Roberts playing on dual reds for Halifax when two seasons ago when the World Cup was on he was like Huddersfield they were talking him up like a big you know he was playing for Ireland and doing really well and obviously he's been taught this week of him going to Salford bit of a surprise yeah. him on there but it's, it's, good, but it's interesting because I, don't, I just don't think Simon Wolf has been a massive fan of of Ollie Roberts and his playing style at, at Huddersfield like, because there's been, there was a few times last season when he just wasn't included in the, the 17 man squads he might have been in the 19 man squad and then missed out on the, on the final match day one so I just don't think he's he's been really in his plans in favour um, so play the balls Ian yeah. so obviously this this new sort of directive came out and obviously you'll, you'll know you'll be much more interested in it than I am Um Tell me your position on the play the ball. Uh, you know, do you think it's right that they they're, they're saying that the foot needs to touch the ball? Uh, I think they need to make a better effort um, than than they had been doing. A lot of the time, it was just that flat footed step over. Mm. Um, where you know the, the needs to be whether they need to touch it with the foot every single time or not is another for, uh, debate for another time. But the need certainly needed to be a better effort. Now a lot of the reason why it was a poor effort was because the ball carry was trying to play it too quick, so he was off balance. So I totally get why they said, "Look, you need to be balanced and, and stood up." A lot of the time, it, the ball carry tried to play the ball when the defenders were still on him. So mm. again, it was all about balance. So because the ball carry wasn't balanced, he wasn't playing it as well as he should do. So I, I get uh, why they tried to to come up with the, the rule, the changes. What I don't really struggling with is how that is a scrum. How, how on earth, if, if somebody's off balance or somebody don't make a genuine attempt to play the ball with a foot, how is that a scrum? Rather than a penalty. Rather than a penalty. So let, let's just say, for instance, there are on average 250 play the balls in a game. So if you get 90% of them perfectly correct, mm. that means you've got 25 which aren't. Mm. So 25 which aren't, if you were to penalise all them 25, and to be honest, we don't get anywhere near 90%, just let's say yeah. Utopia, we get 90%. That means if you scrum it down and it's 30 seconds of scrum, the referee is going to take 12 and a half minutes mm. of non-playing time by having 
you know, 25 scrums mm. for incorrect play the balls. So all, all of a sudden, the refs aren't going to do that because it's just going to come back on them. I don't get why it's a scrum. If you don't play correctly, it's a penalty. You give them the ball, they kick it to touch, it takes seconds. Mm. It's not a case of scrum down, your head and feed, shot clock on, bang, 30 seconds, the ball comes out. It just delays it. And what that means is that referees are thinking, I'm going to let that one ride yeah, because yeah, yeah. we've already got a game where we've already got 10 or 15 natural knock-ons. Mm. So all of a sudden, the referee's going to add another 20 scrums. Is it... I mean, my, my position on this is obviously everyone likes to quick play the ball, but sometimes you go to games and the play the balls are far too quick because ultimately, mm. if a team gets on the front and they're playing the ball lightning fast, mm. they're just scooting up behind them and they can make 70, 80 metres and that's not what people no. really want to see. On the flip side to that, if you were giving penalties for every incorrect play of the ball and people were getting piggybacked 30, 40 metres up the field, and I think I, I, my impression is that that's why they haven't done it that way, but why couldn't you just reset the play of the ball and just say, play the ball again? Because then it takes you back to the playground, doesn't it? You know, time off. Oh, you've not quite done it right, so yeah. we'll give you another go. These are professional players. Mm. They should be able to do it. Unfortunately, the culture and the training that they do. When I used to do my warm-up pre-game, and I know the refs will do it now, as you're doing your warm-up around the pitch and you're getting yourself into the zone, you see teams, and you do it when you turn up to a game. You watch the teams when they go through their pre-match drills. It's all about mapping. It's all about getting the ball. It's all about hitting with the shoulders. But then when they recycle the ball, they literally just throw yeah, it between yeah, the legs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's not a facet of the, of the game that they think is important. So then when they kick off, boom, that's still in the mind. Mm. That's still in the psyche and that's still in the memory bank. So get them to play it. Change the culture. And, and I think scrumming it will not change culture because the refs will be frightened of, of giving 10 scrums because I've already had 15 scrums you, because it's February, the weather's bad. So do you think that's why we didn't see many of them? Because I think it was the one early on in the game at Wigan and then they just sort of, it was almost like forgotten about a bit there after were, that. There were three in the whole Leeds game. Ben Thaler penalised right. three. Uh, all three, as, as per directive, was right. The player was falling over, he was off balance. One of them, he clearly got his foot to it, but because he was off balance, he played it off balance and, and he'd give a scrum. But there was another 50 minimum where there were clear step overs. So mm. it weren't penalised because I don't want to go down that route. I'll go, mm. I'll go down the obvious ones where he's off balance. Yeah. But if I could throw a few penalties in there, which, which don't take a lot of time up, you know, you can get on with it quick and that sends a, a, a more serious message. And I'm just really struggling why the laws committee would, in my opinion, throw the refs under the bus. They've mm. absolutely thrown them. Give a scrum, take more time out of the game, mm. and they might. They just, they just launched them. Is it not? Is there not an argument to say that if they blew for everyone straight away, then that suit the players would soon do it properly? You know, like so. If I started blowing the whistle, I mean that's a theory you see banded about all the time, isn't it? Yeah. But is that in practice the case? What happens? Uh, it doesn't happen. You know, uh, they, they talk about these purges, and and it's just try to, um, you know, shock players into doing what's right for the game but they soon get back into bad habits mm. so it might be alright for three weeks and then they might have a couple of weeks and then yeah it's brilliant and then it'll lapse again and it's just this uh, ebb and flow of highs and lows of, of players just not being able to do it right mm. uh, and I just think uh, by by having a scrum it just takes too much time out of the game mm. and uh, I just think it's a nonsense to have a scrum do you think yeah so do you think Scrums should be scrapped altogether. Oh no, no, I like scrums, but I only like scrums for kicks into touch, knock-ons, and forward passes. I like the fact that you get twelve players plus the two scrum halves out of the way to give the backs a little bit. And it's not if if not, it's just like American football. It's just a full line of attack against a full line of defence. Mm. At least with a scrum, you can put little players on. You can put a short side play on or run a whatever against a, a, a wider gap. I, I have no problem with scrums whatsoever. But I don't want to see 40 of them in a game. I'm quite happy to see a dozen. <laughs> yeah. you know. um, I wanted to ask about Toronto, uh, and specifically about Sonny Bill Williams. Now, Drew wax lyrical about Sonny Bill. But <laughs> the, what I wanted to ask you, Ian, is, as a referee, did you ever get, like, starstruck? You know, like when you're refereeing a game and like say Sonny Bill, you know, obviously when you're at the scrum and you know, yeah. you're there and you're, yeah. you're tidying your mic up and stuff and Sonny yeah. Bill just walks up next to you and yeah. he's packing down. I mean, what's that like? Um, <laughs> quite, quite funny. Uh, Warrington here, uh, first year of my Super League career. Alan Langer, absolute legend. 
ledge of a game and I give a, a forward pass against him uh, and he just put his hands on his, on his hips and just looked at me uh, and I've seen the video of it because it was a Sky game and you can see me like uh, imitating the forward pass because it just like you know how on earth have I give this forward pass <laughs> against the, the, the great Alan Langer and he, he didn't show me any descent I just give this forward pass and he just looked at me and just give me the look and it was like oh my god how on earth can I penalise the great Alan Langer and then once you realise that you know I'm a better referee than Alan Langer is yeah. he's a better player than me but we are each have a role uh, and when you're, when you're in that when, you, when you're on that pitch you know, you're the best at what you do on that pitch at that moment in time. So don't try to be a, a, a Sonny Bill. Don't try to look up to him. You know, he knocked on twice in yeah. his first two things. You know, he's not invincible. He, he's a human being. Great rugby player, per se. You know, and he's got a lot to learn. Mm. But, uh, but no, um, just the shame that Stacey Jones and Alan Langer were my two that I used to think, oh my God. Just the shame the that refs can't game. swap shirts with players. <laughs> yeah. I suppose it's yeah. not the same when refs just swap shirts with yeah, a touch. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I, think, uh, I think that good. I know when we used to go to Catalan, you'd have a lot of fans there saying, uh, just put this scarf around you and just, oh, just put this shirt on and let me have a picture taken with you. No, why not? <laughs> because if I'm there holding a, <laughs> holding a Warrington Wolves top, you know, I'm finished forever. <laughs> oh, don't be so miserable. No, I'm sorry as much as, you know, I'll shake your hand, I'll have a picture with you, but not holding the scarf. <laughs> <laughs> um, Drew, we'll move on to this week then. So England new coach, Sean Wayne, you went to the press conference um, on whatever day it was, Monday. Give us your thoughts. Uh, I'm I'm pretty happy to be honest uh, that Sean Wayne's been appointed. I think he is the right man for for the job. Uh, I think Wayne Bennett did a decent job with England. Obviously, he didn't do a good job with Great Britain last year. He did a good job with England, but I thought I thought he took England as far as he could. Uh, and I think Sean Wayne could take England to to the next level. It's the perfect appointment, really. Sean Wayne obviously out of a job, having recently left Scottish rugby, um, and. I, he's, he's one of the, one of the best English coaches in the game, in my opinion. If not the the, the best English coach uh, in the game, I think he, he spent eight seasons at Wigan, three Grand Final titles, a Challenge Cup, a World Club Challenge. Uh, he's got a pretty impressive record, uh, and what I'd, obviously he's, he's renowned for for bringing the kids through at Wigan, uh, and I think him being England coach, he'll bring the next generation of talent through at England as well. He won't just. Uh, he won't just rest his shoulder, so to speak, on the older heads in the England squad. I, I think he'll give plenty of de- debuts out to, to the young kids as well who are, who are impressed in Super League. It's funny that um, if the Great Britain tour hadn't have happened, Wayne Bennett would probably still have the England job. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, and, but I think it's important, now we've got a new England coach, that the Great Britain identity doesn't just mix with the England identity. So you don't like you don't want year. Wayne as Great Britain coach. No, I, I wouldn't have Wayne as Great Britain coach. And you wouldn't have Wayne Bennett, presumably. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. I'd, I'd, the the obvious candidate for the Great Britain job uh, is Daryl Pearl, in my opinion. And I've Wayne is England and Daryl Pearl is Great Britain, and completely ensure they are separate from one another because last year Wayne Bennett made a couple of comments. Didn't didn't say after a, I think it was a Tonga Test match. Um, where, he's, where he hinted that Lachlan Coote, because he doesn't qualify for England, that's why he didn't, he, he didn't play after so the first test. Race, weren't it? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think it's very, very important that GB and England uh, are a completely separate moving forward. But on the England front, I'm, I'm made up that, that Sean Wayne's been appointed. And, uh, and Kevin Sinfield stepped down from his role with the RFL, which we sort of feel is a good move for him because he needs to focus on Leeds. But I was quite surprised Ralph Rimmer said they're going to look to replace him. I would have thought that now they've got full-time coaching, does that role become... Yeah, I, I was kind of wondering that a little bit because obviously Sean, Sean Wayne is, is the type of coach that he'll watch every Super League game uh, every single week. He'll probably watch it a couple of times over as well because uh, he's obsessed, obsessive over, over that kind of thing. He, and that's what he used to do at Wigan. He used to watch American football games to see him as a, a player who caught his eye and stuff like that. So... Uh, I thought well, Sean Wayne could have filled that gap of rugby director a little bit. Um, so I, I, I kind of think, is it going to be a part-time role for the rugby director? Do they need a, Cause they I, need I mean, a full-time sure. coach? Can I come in? Yes, I'm going in. Jamie Peacock's the team manager. 
Kevin Sinfield was a conflict of interest because of his his time. I don't yeah. mean a negative conflict of interest, but he 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 come, you know, he was you could director of the Leeds and director yeah. of performance at the RFL. Where Jamie Peacock could be direct performance director. Uh, and Amby team manager and yeah. liaise with Sean Wayne as well. But do you uh, feel that like Kevin Sinfield's role was only there because Wayne Bennett was in Australia? I think so. I think it was a conduit between um, the Super League uh, and and Wayne. Mm. You know Wayne Bennett, and and it clearly didn't work because of the Great Britain thing. You know, mm. and and to be fair, they did, they had enough players that they should have got to that World Cup final. You know. They didn't. I don't think they massively overachieved getting to a World Cup final. final. Mm. And I think I think it's important to rem- to remind ourselves of how far we were at that World Cup, Cup final. I, I know the the score was only six 0 to Australia, but I don't think if in the game we played for another three days, I don't think <laughs> England would have beaten Australia. Yeah. Um, everyone goes on about like we was an ankle tap away yeah. from winning the World Cup and everything, but. Even if Watkins had scored that try, it would have yeah. been six well, I mean, all. I, I mean, Australia my... could have scored again. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think we, we were as close in twenty seventeen as, as people some think. people. Well, as much as Tonga have improved and stuff, at the end of the day, it's a three horse race, or it has always been a three horse race between Australia, England, New Zealand, and yeah. anything finishing third is just a minimum expectation, isn't it? Finishing yeah. second is slightly better than expectation, yeah. but ultimately, it's not a massive surprise. Um, Luke Thompson, an England player who's going to play in the NRL um, next season. He's gone from St. Helens to Canterbury Bulldogs as well. It'd be interesting to see how Sean Wayne's picks differ from Wayne Bennett, whether he sticks with the same players or... Oh, I've, I, well, he, he insisted at his press conference that he will pick the best players who are available for, for England. and that Whether goal, they're Australian, that goes, Portuguese well, or that, otherwise. That, well, that goes for uh, overseas-born players as well. He said... He will be, He will pick the the best players who are available for England. I don't know if that'll change in time. I I'm not going to lie. I can't imagine Sean Wayne picking Australian born players. Um, I, what about that, Saint Ellen's born players? <laughs> I, I think I think he'll oh, be okay get an Australian. Born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I did ask. I know Alex Warms isn't Saint Ellen's born, but I did ask him yesterday. I said to him, I said, "Do you think that playing for Saint Ellen's might be a disadvantage now?" Sean Wayne's a, the Wigan coach, but he he laughed it off and he he says. He expects Sean Wayne to pick the best. To be fair, Alex Warms is probably the sort of player that actually suits the way Sean Wayne yeah. plays. And, and Luke Thompson. Yeah. Um, and just on Luke Thompson, I think that it's a great move for him. Um, I think he's at the right stage in his career now to to make the the move over to the NRL. English forwards always tend to do well in the NRL. It's, I think it's the, it's the backs that have, have struggled in recent years over there. Well, it's like Watkins um, and Hall have gone over there, and you know you still, you know, know Watkins only went sort of back end the last season, but. You didn't really hear much of them, no. did you? In comparison, Ryan, to Ryan Hall, it, a couple of injuries didn't help him, did it? Because he's clearly a, a, a mm. world class mm. winger. But I, I agree with Drew. You know, the forwards seem to do well. Mm. You know, your James Graham. But just just touching on the Sean Wade, you know, not he's going to bring the youngsters through. Luckily for him, if that's the right word, he has no choice because he's lost Sean O'Loughlin. Mm. James Graham has finished. Sam Burge is through injury. So, you know, they're three world-class, mm. experienced players. So he has no choice but to bring the next generation through. So so that's an opportunity. They can say, well, I had no choice, but wow, mm. look how well they've done. Mm. And obviously he was successful at Wigan. And get, um, Gareth Woodups coming yeah, towards Woodups the back on, end yeah. of his career. Is that, is it 30, 30, 31? Yeah. yeah, so... Big opportunity for Sean Wayne. Um, I've I, 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 I think it's done uh, George Williams a, a big favour, though. Uh, well, Sean I mean, he's Wayne, another one you mentioned about forwards area, and George Williams, I suppose, is one this season that you'll be watching it at half to see how he does. Interesting at Cambria, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. obviously, it doesn't strike you that the Aussie clubs will give you a lot of time to bed in, whereas the other way round, if we mm. sign an Australian halfback, they tend to get a few you know, a few mm. games graced, don't they? Whereas you could imagine if he has a couple of bad games early doors, yeah, he might get malleted. The, because they got to the grand final last year, Canberra, so really the, their yeah. expectation level, it's a bit like Salford with respect yeah. to Salford got to a grand final, you know, all of a sudden they're talking about, they, you know, minimum made the playoffs. Yeah. Well, 12 months ago, you know, they were, they were probably one of favourites for relegation, so yeah. sometimes it's just be careful what you wish for. Yeah. There's big pressure on George, George Williams' shoulders as well at, at the Raiders because look, he's, he's replaced Aiden Caesar, he's pushed Aiden Caesar out of the team, so a lot of the Raiders fans will be expecting mm. Williams to be better than Caesar uh, straight away uh, mentioning Salford actually in your first Super League game 
was London versus Salford, I believe. It was, and yeah. I don't wish to make you sound old, but that was actually on my 11th birthday. That <laughs> right. game. Thank you. I think I was, must have been 13 then. <laughs> what, do you remember much from the game? or? Uh, no, no, it's all a bit of a... They could have got you on near her own, couldn't they? The London they could, Salford. yeah. I think that was just to get me out of the way and just to see what it was like. But I think it's like like most things, you know, you you, you set you set little goals and and uh, I didn't start refereeing until I was thirty. You know, it seems it's so changed now. You know, back in in the the nineties, you know, people almost either finished the ref uh, the playing career or waited till they were established adults before they took up refereeing. Now. Um, you know, if, if you haven't virtually made it by the time you're 23, 24, you're almost you know, written too off. old, written off. Be, oh, I can't go into refereeing, I'm, I'm already 24 type of thing. And it, it, it was a case of, you know, that was just, you had to wait till you were in your 30s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was, God, 90, 99 was 99 it? that was, yeah. Just tell yeah, us a little bit what, it, what it's like, what it's like being a full-time ref and what that looks like. Um... As a, I'll, I'll just nip on the, the, the part-time ref. As a part-time ref, obviously, all the refs then had full-time jobs. And when you refereed a Super League game, every single person connected with that Super League game uh, when the refs were part-time was full-time. The players, the coaching staff, you know, every, every single person. So then I'd do a full day's work, and all the other lads would. And then we'd rock up, you know, after doing a full day's work. And, and try to, there, and, yeah. yeah, and try to do a Wigan Saints game or, <laughs> yeah. a, you know, Lee Bradford game or a little car or whatever it was. You know, and that had to change. You know, the game demanded that we had to be more professional and full time. I was as professional as I possibly could be, yeah. but on a part time basis. You know, I'd, I'd work all day, then I'd train at night. You didn't get to be with the group of lads except for two or three sessions a month. Mm. You know, so and as a full time ref, when I was full time, um, if your game was a Sunday, uh, we'd do a pool session on a Monday. Do your pre your review of your game with your coach. Uh, and then Tuesday you'd train hard on a Tuesday, go into a group review, Wednesday you were day off, Thursday, because when I ref they didn't have the Thursday night game, it was Friday or Saturday then or Sunday. Um, so you train on a Thursday, go into your preview, so you'd look at the teams that you, you had, uh, you'd talk to the other lads as a collective, and you'd say, right, I've got such a body, and they'd say, this is a player they've started putting on, let's have a look at it, we'd look at it on the screen, We'd look at protagonists who was going to cause you most trouble and, and just really get you into that game mode of, right, this is what I've got, this is how I want to set it up. And, and, um, so that was Thursday, and depending on when your game was, how your, your weekend panned out regarding food, nutrition, extra training. It was just a wonderful, wonderful life. You know, if, if, if any of the people who are watching this want to become referees, I'd really, you know... Um, I know I talk about some of the negativities and the abuse and, and mm. the verbal stuff that does have an impact on, on the refs, but it's a fantastic career. Yeah. You know, I love the game. You, you, you open me up, my DNA is rugby league, and I was rubbish as a player, so the next best thing for me was refereeing, and it, it's a great career. You finished in 2010. Mm. Is there a bit of regret that you finished that early? Oh, absolutely. Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, it came off the back of a Hull versus Leeds game at the KC where I sent off Lee Radford for punching Ryan Bailey. Um, you mentioned protagonist, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what unfor- that was a Sky game, and unfortunately what I hadn't seen was that just before Lee Radford stood up and punched Ryan, uh, was that Ryan Bailey had elbowed Lee on the ground. Now, going back to the video ref and the Chris Hill incident, Thierry Alibur was my video ref, uh, and he saw a replay of the incident just before Lee had punched Ryan. And he couldn't tell me because that went against mm. policy. Um, and unfortunately, I made the wrong decision. Sent off Lee Radford, and then they showed it on the big screen. <laughs> uh, all the fans realised I got it wrong. And from that, after the game, Hull lost. Leeds, Leeds scored two late drives, one eighteen fourteen. And when I got back in the changing room, the police match commander who was in there said that he couldn't guarantee me safe passage to my car after because... There were about three or four hundred Hull fans who wanted to rip my head off. I think that's why they wanted to rip off. <laughs> uh, and they had to go and I had to give me police another policeman my car keys, and he went and got my car and drove it into the stadium by a different exit uh, entrance, and just all that um, emotional stuff. I just wasn't ready for mm. not to that degree. I'd, I'd had obviously I'd been loads of abuse before but not to that degree and then Stuart gave me an opportunity Stuart Cummings at the time to go on the coaching staff 
and it was the wrong question at the wrong time in where I was in the wrong frame of mind mm. uh, and I just made a really irrational decision to retire from referee and I miss it every day I have a mm. knot the size of a fist in my stomach because mm. I love it mm. you know I loved you know as soon as I got all that whistle you know it was like my revolving door I had a different mm. persona and and you know, again, I talked about the negativities, but there's nothing better than, than running out on a field, that adrenaline buzz, that high of, of being on a pitch with all these wonderful professional players at elite level. Mm. And I'll never replicate that, mm. you know, even though I love what I do with State of Mind, by the way. <laughs> I mean, so was it that the whole, you didn't want to put yourself in that position where if you refereed another game that that might happen again? It, yeah, it, I think it was just the perfect storm. E everything came together at that time that made me just go, I've had enough. Mm. Um, maybe Vance sent him off. Maybe Vance had to have an escort to my car. Maybe Stuart then wouldn't have asked me. Maybe if he did, I wasn't ready. And it, mm. it, was, just, it was just that perfect storm where everything aligned for me to make the worst decision of my me, of me professional career mm. to retire. Did, did, did the RFL offer you any support during that time? Uh, no, it? because it, because you didn't ask for support. We we had a couple of uh, clinicians that used to come in, um, but we we didn't ask for that support because one um, talking about mental health was such a taboo subject. Mm. You know, this is pre Terry Newton. Mm. Yeah. You know, you know, God Ten bless him. Ago, yeah. This is Terry New before Terry Newton took his own life. So even after Terry took his own life, it was like shock, horror. You know, how on earth can we allow these, you know, people like Terry to slip through the net? So nobody talked about it. I didn't want to say to the other refs, God, how do you deal with that? Mm. You know, because I didn't want them to think, ooh, you know, because there's, unlike all your teams, they all want to get to a grand final. They all want to win a Challenge Cup final. There's only one grand final, one Challenge Cup final, and the refs are incredibly competitive. You know, they want that edge. They want to make sure that they, they're better than the next person mm. to get that big gain. So a lot of it, you don't show your emotions, you don't ask for help in that field because you don't want to be seen, be seen to be weak mentally mm. and emotionally. And to be honest, I thought I was. I thought I was pathetic. Mm. I thought, what on earth are you getting upset by people who are abusing you? So you don't. You just put this stoic face on and this, there's nothing wrong type of thing. And and it's such a shame. And that and that obviously sort of underpins your work with state of mind. Now mm. I know obviously me and you've sat in plenty of sessions and stuff like that. And and I I I was said to you earlier. I think I, I remember you saying you were doing a game. I think it was at Lee where you were walking from your car before the game, and people mm. were like, "Oh, it's, it's Ian yeah. Smith," you know. Yeah. And, and, and that's and that's a regular. And that's a regular with all of them. You know, ninety minutes before kickoff, ninety minutes before your professional work uniform on, you're told you're a joke, you're a disgrace, you're a cheat. You know, and yeah, some come up and, and it's a little bit of banter and shake your hand, hey, come on in, you, I hope you're better this week than last week. But some of it's incredibly verbal and incredibly vocal and incredibly abusive, mm. you know, and we're just expected to laugh it off because it's banter. Mm. You know, well, well, one person's banter is another person's bullying, so just be careful how you say it. Mm. And um, and do you think that's, a, obviously we've seen a lot of referees walk away from the game in, in recent years and... You know, I, I think you feel that that abusive side is is one of the main problems with not only making refs turn away from the game, but struggle recruiting new refs. Oh, recruitment retention is is, is huge. You know, the, the recruitment side of it. Why on earth, when you see what you see, especially now on social media, why on earth would you want to go into that environment where you know that no matter what decision you give, somebody is going to have a go at you, mm. uh, very verbally. Uh, very vociferous and sometimes threatening yeah, you know Robert Tix had to meet somebody down here yeah, uh, yeah. Warrington yeah. Uh, a fan who sent a death threat mm. a death threat through missing a forward pass or a knock mm. on you know what sort of a world are we living in that, 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 you, will send a, yeah. that you will send that so if, if I was trying to recruit referees you know what's my sales pitch well <laughs> do you know something every single decision you make is under <laughs> massive amount of scrutiny you'll be doing it having run 11 kilometres you'll do it with your heart rate four times more than your normal resting heart rate and you will not please anybody and you'll have people coming at you after the game giving you so much verbal abuse and the money's poor <laughs> yeah. on top of all that <laughs> whoopie doo da yeah. you know and, and, and people just go you know they say let's get uh, ex-players in you know, but players, first and foremost, players, their instinct is as a player. Mm. A referee, first instinct as a referee. Now, I always use the analogy regarding speaking a different language. So if I 
if I want to speak French, mm. I listen to it in English, I translate it in my thoughts and I speak it in French. And for me, and that takes time, and that's mm. for me is why players that have started refereeing are not as good and not as quick yeah. thinking as a referee. Because they see the incident as a player, they translate it what it should be as a ref, mm. and then they deliver the decision as a ref. But that loop and that time takes too long. Mm. As soon as you blow your whistle, people want to know. And you see multiple decisions going on, and the referee's got to go, right, that's that, that's that, that's that, that's that, right, this is what it is. Mm. You know, it's like that decision with the, the charge down. As soon as Chris Can uh, Kendall yeah. gave that decision on Friday, I knew exactly what it was. I knew exactly that he judged that yeah. it was a rising ball. It wasn't, oh, let's have a look at a replay. Because that's Your what instinct. I am. I, yeah. That's my instinct. I'm a referee. And referee's instinct is as a referee. And players and referees are still a million miles apart. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a, you know, it always generates lots of debate on, on the decision mm. side of things and that. I know, I know that they wouldn't, there wouldn't be a game without the referee. And, and people maybe are quick to forget. Absolutely. Forget about that. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, you know, a lot of people go to the game to try and vent some anger, you know, yeah. that, that might have happened in the personal, the professional, the social life during the week, and it's right, I'm here this weekend, and I'm going to shout and ball. Now, you either shout and ball at the opposition players, but it's so easy to shout and ball at the ref. He's a pantomime villain. Yeah. He's a person that's turned up every week just to spoil your enjoyment. And you know, Summer, he or she is having it this week. And, uh, and, and we've got to change that mentality yeah. because... The referee is very much an, an integral part of the game. You, um, there's some really good. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot with this. No, really, right. but there's some really good stats that you always use in your state of mind sessions. Um, can you remember the one about the decision? How many decisions is it a game? Oh, they, they reckon there's about twenty five thousand judgments in a game because you've got all the ten meters, the markers, the eleven hundred passes. You know the two hundred fifty play the balls where you've got two markers. You've got the acting half. Uh, you've got all the tens, all the kicks, all the scrums, all the different people. So, if you were to actually make an individual judgment on every single one of them, they reckon there's in, in the region of twenty five thousand judgments per you know, game. Per game. Uh, and you know we and they still do uh, GPS and heart rate data. So GPS, a referee will run between ten and eleven kilometers in eighty minutes. Mm. You guys run for eleven kilometers, listen to music. You will be tired yeah. without making a decision. You know, I would lose two litres in sweat. I would burn 1,700 calories, pretty much a day's calories. My average heart rate was 155 beats a minute. It would max out to 178, and I'd kick the game off at 134. Um, if I'm sat at home with a remote control watching rugby on telly, my resting heart rate is high 40s, low 50s. At least, so, at least could eat so whatever you wanted after the game. Like. Absolutely. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Where did you yeah. used to go then, Ian, after yeah, the game? Oh, <laughs> it depends. It's some, of, some of the grounds have fantastic food. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the good thing about it, we, we used to have a nutritionist, you know, and I could eat 3,374 calories a day. <laughs> now, if I eat that much, I think I'll <laughs> wait on. But, you know, it, it's but what people don't understand when they sat at home. And somebody tweeted a picture of me. Uh, I don't really remember the decision on Friday night where there's a pass inside and the touch judge missed it where the foot was on the touch line. And oh, the one where Hardik scored. Where Hardik and went, went back, through the yeah. score and they went back. And somebody tweeted me this picture and said, look, what is he looking at there? His foot is clearly on the line. Mm. So, but he's, look, he's probably looking at the foot and he assumes that the ball has already left. Because it's not illegal to put your foot on the line. Well, yeah, if it's, it's only. It's well, I mean, it's almost like peripheral vision because you can't look absolutely. at where the ball yeah, is absolutely. on the touchline. So at the he's same got time. to try and get peripheral vision. He's probably focused on the foot, assuming that the ball's come out, and and it's a freeze frame. Mm. Of course, it's wrong. Yeah, yeah. But you try running up and down and all yeah. around and all this lot, and then in whatever minute, then come up with that decision that is not in freeze frame. You know, uh, just quickly, I know. You no, no, no. no. Uh, players are allowed to make mistakes. Mm. You know, if if you two have got an overlap, he passes it to you. All you've got to do is catch the ball mm. and go in the corner and you drop the ball and it goes into touch. People will come up and don't yeah, worry, yeah. great positioning. So, all right, referee misses that, that pass that goes in the corner. Oh, my God, mm. all hell lets loose. Mm. So the expectation of the players, uh, or sorry, the expectation of the referee's performance is far higher than the expectation the of the players. Players can miss a tackle. Mm. Sonny Bill Williams, <laughs> on ridiculous amounts of money, his first two touches of the ball, he dropped it. If Ben Thaler had made two major mistakes like that that, that yeah. give the ball to the opposition, 
he'd have been pilloried. Mm. But mm. yeah, the you know arguably the world's most expensive player can. Well, no argument. Well, he is. Well, he is. Uh, no, I, I was going to say the world's best player. He could pay for an awful, yeah. he could pay for an awful <laughs> lot of referees he with could. his salary. Yeah, sure, um, before we look ahead to the weekend's games, there's one more thing I wanted to ask you about, Ian, and I'm not sure how you feel about this. Gareth Hock, 2008 manhandling incident involving you as a referee. He got a five match ban. Yeah. Now, manhandling the ref became quite fashionable after this you, you never you never heard of it before then but then what's happened you, there used to be bands coming up every week contact with the referee what 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 sort of happened in that situation and 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 what what's the sort of the procedure that you have to follow after such I, <clears throat> um it was quite a, a strange one really because what people don't understand is during the game that the, the referee is is heightened you know his emotions are running high and and i give I give a knock on, and it were either I either give a goal line drop out or a tap twenty. It was in the in goal area, and whatever I'd given, obviously Gareth thought it was wrong. So as I give the decision, he's right next to me, and he literally grabs my shoulder and just just yeah. pulls once I pulls me around like that. But I think because I was in such shock because that's not what you expected. As soon as I felt me my shoulder turn around like that, you know, I just said, "Get off, off you go." Mm. And to be fair to him, he went off. Brian Noble, who was a Wigan coach then, phoned me in the morning and said, you know, look, Gareth Ox asked for your number. Can he please phone you uh, to apologise? I said, well, he can by all means. However, the report's gone through, this and the other, and whatever he receives by the disciplinary, that's what he'll receive. And he said he has no problem with that. Mm. But <coughs> he realised that uh, he didn't mean to do it, mm. but it was it was, instinct, it yeah. was instinct. And he phoned me up, he said, Ian, I'm really sorry. I said, Gareth, absolutely fine. Uh, I had no choice but to send you off because uh, it was a bit of a shock as well. Mm. He said, it's fine. And he, he, got, he got five he got matches. Five. I thought, I'd have been happy with three. <laughs> I, I thought, I thought three that. matches, to yeah. be fair, was about right. I, I mean, thought five was a little bit excessive, but it, you it, know, that's not my decision. Because we've seen Chris Oston do it at Witness, didn't we? Yeah, where, twice where with it, Phil Bentham. Yeah. We were talking about that before, weren't we? That's, yeah. that's where yeah. Bentham got, got injured, ne- didn't Never refereed yeah. again yeah. since. Uh, damaged nerve and, and a disc and a, a disc in his neck, uh, and has never refereed again. Mm. You know, it's such a shame because he's one of the best refs of all time, and he, he was clearly head and shoulders the best ref in the game at the time. Mm. Uh, he didn't get anything for the first time he knocked him over, but I think he got three for yeah, the second. Yeah, the second, but they were, but both of them were very subjective, weren't they? They were very like. You, you, no one could possibly. You can't. Well, you, the look on your face suggests otherwise. But to me, watching the video, it was almost a bit like there was didn't appear to be any deliberate or malice or in it. But you. Oh look, you I, it was it was a kick, and Phil's turned round. Now, as a player, you uh, now, the now, ref to now, be now, now, bear in mind, I, I like Chris Hansen. I did quite a bit with him at the witness off law, yeah, yeah. uh, and he, he's very prevalent regarding mental health. So you know, this is not against Chris per se, but uh, as players. They, they coached every single day to do fast foot feet, evasion, mm. understand peripheral vision, and they do all these ladder works, and they do everything they can to change direction in a split second. Now, where your camera is there, mm. if, if I kick a ball over your camera, mm. if I look at the wall at the back, I mm. can still see the camera. Mm. So even though I might be looking at that yeah, light on that back wall, that. I can still see a camera, and Phil had a different colour on, so yeah. it weren't like he was pushing. Yeah. So Phil's not ready for contact, he had the rest, my, the the camera, yeah, yeah, so he had all that the wires daft and all that. Yeah. backpack that they have to wear now, <laughs> um, and and Chris, there was enough there that Chris he should have gone, gone round him, mm-hmm. you know, and just to say I'm looking at the ball, I didn't see him, I'm looking at the ceiling, I can still see yeah, that yeah, tripod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I thought it was poor. They, they did clamp down on it though a little bit. I mean, we mentioned Gareth. Like I got, I was actually at two games where he got, he got done for similar things. Where one, I don't remember seeing it in the game, but another one was where I think he 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 ended up going into the in goal official after a try or something like that and got sent off. Um, that was about twenty fourteen. Where yeah, some of it just sometimes it's emotion, it's just, and but yeah. you you the, there's just certain things you can't do. I know in Australia they they virtually got it the other way around where you can't literally. You know, excuse me. Yeah, you, you know, can't and, that, and it's yeah. literally you can't touch. Mm. You know, God, the amount of times I've had players say, yeah, 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 just yeah, yeah. You know, that's, and it's that's, not they're not doing anything wrong. Diff- it's just you know yeah. that's different. I've had players standing on your foot because they're coming back to the line. They know you're there. And they, oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, they know exactly where you're at. <laughs> Trust me. What um, just before we go on the fixes, I know I keep saying that, but what do you think of the dual ref system in Australia? 
Uh, I don't like it. You don't like no, it? No, no, I don't, if I'm being honest. Um, I think it breeds inconsistency. I'll set a game up for four or five sets and all of a sudden my oppo's going to do the next three different personalities. Do I, do, does he, even though he's listening to you, does he know really what's, what the, how, how I'm seeing the, the, mm. the speed of the rook and the 10 metres and the verbal? And then all of a sudden, if, with respect, if you're an inferior referee to me, Will they challenge you a little bit more? Will yeah. they stand in front of you? Will they hold on? And and I think it's is it so? Is it more of a case of authority? Do you think? Uh, I think they they brought it in because if somebody's at the back of the tackle, the players are less likely to leg pull. Yeah, but it's almost like managing the play. The second ref, it feels like they're just there to almost manage a yeah a clean play the ball. Yeah, yeah, um, and like they are called a, a pocket ref, but then. I, I don't even think the Australians particularly enjoy it. Right. I know after the grand final last year because of, of that. Yeah, the dynamic. Debacle. So do you no, think? Do you think? They, sorry, go on. Uh, there's been a lot of calls in this country to have the the dual ref system, but then I've noticed a lot on, on a lot of pages in Australia. A lot of their fans want to copy our rules. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Just go with one ref. Yeah, yeah. Well, but you've got 23 full time referees in Australia, and they've more coaches than we've got refs. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's more. They've got more pool of referees doing the New South Wales under twenties comp than we have the in the all of the country. Mm. So it's great to say, yeah, right, we'll we'll, we'll, have, two, we'll yeah. have two refs. We haven't really got enough for one, for one. Yeah. around the game, let alone for two. It is so. What, what is a solution to have the pocket ref be in the pocket ref throughout? Where do you think that would be the best better uh, solution? Quite, quite possibly, but so then you almost have, have a one kick down field and then they move in. I don't know whether you've noticed at the moment, but if there's a play the ball within ten meters of the touchline. The touch judge yeah, will come in and stand on, up. Yeah. Over it. So almost when things are within ten meters of the touchline, the touch judge is almost coming on yeah, and, and being like the, the job of the pocket ref. Pocket ref. Yeah. So if, if you've a pitch at sixty five meters wide, you've ten there, ten there. So the referee can just control mm. the middle forty five. Mm. So I, I've never been a lover of two. I went out to Australia in two thousand and fourteen, and I did a lot of research with uh, listening to a lot of tapes because you know when John Sharp was head of the refs. With Blake, Solly, and, and one or two others, they thought about bringing the two refs in, mm. um, and I listened to a lot of voice tapes of the refs, and they were just contradicting each other. What yeah. also lost, sorry to just no, no. going on there. What they also lost was the rapport with the players because they were too busy talking, talking to, to each, each other. other right. right, you take this set, yeah, right, and all of a sudden, the one thing that you know the older refs in particular used to really like was the refs would talk. Russell Smith was probably the best talker to players mm. you know there was along with your Dave Campbell's if you're going back to yesteryear because it'd be like hey come on mm. I need another yard out of you Drew you're just pinching a little bit but I, I in Australia they've lost that mm. because they're too busy talking yeah. to each other mm. you know and I, I think Ben Thaler to be fair Ben Thaler talks a hell of a lot to players mm. you know he tries to get a rapport now if Ben had a, a pocket ref He'd be like, "Oh, who am I talking to you? Yeah. And to you?" And that's not a crack at Ben, by the way. No, it's just yeah. a case of that's yeah. just a natural you know, thing. It's just like a natural that. thing. You know, some refs like to have that rapport with players and think you get more out of it, and that's that's the camp I'm in. Brilliant, brilliant insight, there, Ian. Um, we'll look ahead to this weekend then. Super League. I mean, Warrington haven't had the easiest start, have they? I mean, Saint Helens on Thursday. How do you see that one going, Drew? I've not even made my predictions yet, but I'll, I'll have to tip Saint Helens. Um, I was really impressed with Irwin over Salford last week. I expected it to be much of a closer game, a close contest. I was a little bit let down by Salford, but Saints were on fire. Um, I'm a massive fan of, of Jack Wells, because the stuff he can do at just 18 years of age. A lot of people were saying, why, why haven't Saints recruited in the off-season? Well, that's why. You've got young kids like James Bentley, Jack, Jack Wells, being Aaron Smith, who were coming through, uh, who were who already Super League standard. Uh, I'll tip... I'll tip Saints by 10. I'll go. Ian? Uh, I'll tip Saints by 16. Oof. I think, I think they, they'll, they'll be... be pre- I think they'll be just too good. I thought they, they were outstanding. I think people... For, um, we've almost like forgot how much... Over the <laughs> off-season, you forgot how much... They were so much better than everyone else, weren't yeah. they? It wasn't even close. 16 points they won yeah. the lead by. 16 yeah. points. Yeah. That's eight wins... In front of yeah. uh, second and third. Um, Friday night's games, um, the Sky game, I presume, is Hull, Hull, Hull KR. Yeah, and then Casford Wigan is also on Friday. Um, I believe Hull KR have had 4,000 Mossy Masoy masks printed. Uh, I'll have to get you is one it, of them. Is it, is it a, 
It's that Hull FC. It's that Hull FC. But yeah, they've had four. Got to go Hull FC, haven't you? They've had four thousand Mossy Masai masks mm. um, done. So I think at the tenth minute they're all being told to put this oh. mask on, and then Sky are going to pan round the ground. So that'll That's be a, a nice little touch. A nice touch. So what? What are you saying then? Hull and Wigan. I, I really like the look of of Hull. Uh, the forward pack, as you mentioned before, it, it's enormous, isn't it? It's big, biggest pack in the comp. Uh, I think Lee Radford said a couple of times in the off season if. The, like it's been no secret that they, they just want to bully oppos- opposition teams uh, this year and I, I think they will do that an awful lot uh, I've got to go Hull FC by 14 as uh, as it's a derby and I'll go oh, I'll go Wigan by 8 I think it'll be but, but they've, they've found uh, Castleford a tough place to go in recent years um, yeah uh, it's quite funny, really, because players, uh, teams, are a, a, a mirror image of their coach. And you talk about bullying. Lee Radford <laughs> was. Uh, I'm not saying he was a bully, a bully on the field because yeah. of his aggression. Yeah. And he's now, <coughs> excuse me, he's now got a team that are aggressive and they're you know that's what he was. Well, suppose the Bradford, drive, the Bradford packs but, that he played. Oh, in like that, tremendous! Yeah. But I all I also, uh, the derby will will make a difference. If, if if it wasn't, I know they are obviously it's a derby, but on paper Hull should win that by twenty eight, but because it is a derby, I'm going ten to Hull. Hull, Hull to ten, and yeah. Cast Wigan. Um, even though Wigan won, I wasn't massively impressed with Wigan, uh, and I thought Castleford were pretty good against yeah. an ordinary defensive Toronto yeah. team. To be fair, so I'm going to go uh, Cast by four. Cast by four. Saturday is Salford Toronto. This is an interesting one because I was really disappointed with Salford uh, last week and I, I know everyone were expecting Saints to win anyway but uh, that margin I didn't expect that um, but I was also really disappointed with uh, Toronto at Cast. I thought they would, some of the defence at times was atrocious uh, from the Wolfpack especially out wide I, I, I thought Castleford nicked uh, more than a couple of tries that they shouldn't have scored um, so I'll be going with Salford home advantage even though Toronto will play Manchester, uh, train in Manchester as well. I'll go to uh, Salford, sorry, by 22. Oof. Yeah. Right. Well, I think it's a flip of a coin. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I don't think Toronto can have as bad a kicking game. Everything was lateral, 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 and mm. they, give the, they turn the ball over on the halfway line instead of kicking it deep. If they do that again, mm. Salford will murder them. Mm. Uh, if they have a good kicking game, um, I'm saying... A draw. A draw? You're going for a draw, are Yeah, and then... Is it still golden point? Golden point, yeah. And then An I'm extra going, ten minutes I'm for the going, ref and run around. I'm going Salford on a golden point. Salford on a golden point. A bold shout. You'll get plenty for that at the bookies here. <laughs> um, and then Sunday, it's Huddersfield Leeds. Wakefield against Catalan, so... Um, Huddersfield Leeds will be very interesting because Huddersfield obviously started the season so well. And I fancy Huddersfield. Yeah, I, right. I, I, think I, I think I might tip Huddersfield this week. I'll go Huddersfield by... Two, and it's he's a penalty goal. Push the ball. <laughs> uh, I, I, th- I agree. I think um, I think Huddersfield. I di- I didn't watch the game, but reading the reports mm. and you know I thought I believe they were outstanding, mm. and I thought Leeds were ordinary. Mm. You know now unless Leeds really up, up the game. Yeah, they've had a rocket. Or something. Uh, uh, if they've had, if they, yeah, they'll they'll have to have a, a rocket, won't they? You know because they've they've clearly got the personnel, but it's not just about personnel, is it? It's about on the day, yeah. and I think Huddersfield. I think it'll just feel by four. I, I, I just think there's, there's too much pressure on Luke Gale's shoulders at Leeds this year. I think Even though they've got Rob Lewis and, and Marlon. Yeah, yeah. Even. yeah I th- I, Is they're it, I, relying I, on Luke Gale to be this superstar signing, but we need to remember that Luke Gale's not played a competitive game for 18 months before last week. I, my mm. issue with Leeds is I'm just, I worry about Hooker. I mean, I know Leeming was injured, so didn't play. But I think I, my, part of me thinks that that's what they're missing. They've not got... a. Uh, a top class hooker that a lot of the other teams mm. have got and I think ultimately the hooker's the key position in the modern game because they dictate the tempo they decide which way the ball goes from dummy half they decide you know whether it's a four, you know what plays they do and I just part of me worries about Leeds whether that's what they're missing rather than mm. Leeds played know. well when Sean Lunt and Matt Parcell were, was nine they had some yeah. more direction because uh, Dwight, Dwight you know don't get me wrong Dwight's good off the bench you know adds a bit of pace you know quick, quick scoots from dummy half but 
it's not, it's not an, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. And and I think that's maybe where they've got to. There'll be a lot of attention on Wakefield Catalan if uh, Israel Falau plays. Um, do you think it'll be an emotionally charged Wakefield win? Well, yeah, I've said, I've said it a couple of times as well. It's a, it's it's a shame, really, uh, that Keegan Hurst has made the move to to, uh, <laughs> to Halifax because there, there could have been a, a bit of extra spice in, in that one, couldn't there? Um, but this is an interesting one for both sides because... Catalans obviously were atrocious last week, and uh, I think Wakefield uh, going on on the back of round one. I think they're going to struggle, so it's it's going to be a um, golden point draw. draw a golden point. I don't, <laughs> I don't think it'll be. It'll make for good view in this game anyway. Um, is it? It's Wakefield. It's at Wakefield, yeah. I'll go Wakefield by six. Um, because I I didn't I didn't see Wakefield or Catalan. I don't know why the reason why Catalan won. I don't know whether they got beat up or whether they were complacent, mm. or, or you know it was just a first first hit mm. out poor. Um, I think Catalan are the better players, mm. uh, and I think over the no disrespect to Wakefield by the way, but I think over the the full squad Catalan have the better players, and I think if you've got the better players, generally you'll win. Mm. Um, so I'm going with Catalan by six. I like this having a, a guest on because it means I don't have to do the predictions. <laughs> um, the championship fixtures this week are Lee versus Sheffield, Toulouse versus Oldham. Are you going France in? You no, I'm not. I'd love the chip to yeah, France. I, I would have done, yeah. Uh, London, Whitehaven, Swinton, Dewsbury, Witness, Batley, top of the league, Witness. Um, York, Bradford, Featherstone against Halifax. Featherstone, Halifax is the hour league game this week, quarter past six on Sunday if you want to watch that. Ian, thanks very much for coming on. Oh, 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 oh hang got, on, Drew's got, got his special. I've got, I've got, I've got uh, how could I forget? Uh, quick, quick fire, fire questions. questions. Oh, oh, oh so as quick as you can. You could have, you could have done that Try. before. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Favourite game you've refereed? Uh, Wigan Saints on a good Friday when um, I should have sent off um, Terry Newton for breaking Sean Long's jaw. I'll <laughs> never, ever forget it. <laughs> uh, so what's your career highlight? Uh, certainly not that. <laughs> um, I I never refereed a major grand final or a Challenge Cup final, but I video refed a couple of them, and I video refed the one where uh, Ben Flower got sent off, oh. and, and that was an amazing night for probably all the wrong reasons. Um, but I, I, when I started refereeing, I never thought I'd, I'd referee just short of three hundred matches in Super League. So I'm going to say every one of them was a the highlight. So, uh, what's your best rugby memory? You don't. You, you don't have to be a ref for this one. It could be as a fan. Oh my god! Or it could be outside of the game. Instead. Um, I think it's when Oldham scored a try against the touring Australians in '86, um, and we still lost, but we came really close. And at Watershed Inns, that it was just phenomenal. It was just a fantastic night that we pushed this great Australian team um, all the way. And as a young as a young lad then, because in eighty six, what well, I'd have only you'd only been about four, <laughs> would you? I'd only just been born. <laughs> <laughs> but your favourite rule in the game? Oh, um, I really like the forty twenty when they brought that in. You know, I, I thought it it adds to the kicking game. I believe that they might be thinking about bringing a twenty forty in. Yeah, uh, I'm not quite. They're sure doing like the NRL, well. I think, aren't they? Yeah, I, 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 I like the forty twenty. Good, good. Uh, what rule would you change in the game? Uh, oh my god what what rule would I change oh I know it's supposed to be quick fire uh, I'd, I'd change where you're not allowed to trap the ball at the back of the scrum video referee good or bad oh good uh, most annoying player which player was more the, the, uh, the nuisance am I allowed to say Danny Bruff are we allowed to yeah, you can uh, say <laughs> I hope you're not watching <laughs> <laughs> no the, the worst the worst captain that I ever a referee was a guy called Jim Dimmock it was a rubber, oh, uh, an Aussie London, legend, yeah. London. Oh my God! Every time I penalise London, he will go apoplectic. So I'm going with Jim Dimmock because he's not really. Favorite ground? Uh, oh, favorite ground. I like, I like Uddersfield. Uddersfield was uh, was good. Uh, the KC is a, a phenomenal stadium, but generally for all the wrong reasons <laughs> for me. But uh, I, I won't mind refereeing at, at the new Edinley Stadium. It looks, yeah, it looks awesome. Good, yeah. But no, I'm going with um, Odysseus. Yeah. Donny School for Paul Phil Vivas. <laughs> uh, I think Danny School was a brilliant forward, and I think Phil Vivas was a brilliant back. 
Uh, who was the easiest captain to deal with? Uh, oh my word! Uh, Paul Skulltop. We'll say Paul. He weren't, but I'll, I'll go. With, <laughs> if we're talking about the Skullies, I'll go with Paul. Uh, the nicest compliment you have or comment? Uh, oh, you got I'll, that I'll, one. I'll, you I'll, got I'll, that I'll, one right. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not like you to get that right. <laughs> um, most embarrassing moments. Uh, oh, when I got uh, I got pushed over by, which was the Smith that played at St. Helens? Was it Darren Smith or Jason Smith? Darren Smith, I think. Was it Darren at Saints? Uh, yeah, I got I got pushed over on Sky on Friday night. I was I was going into the Ingall area and I got in his way. And as he come through, he pushed me, and and it took me ages to fall. Uh, and I, and I was watching uh, Soccer AM, believe it or not, on the Saturday morning. Never ever watched it. And on Soccer AM at that time, they said, yeah, I watched this. This is the most embarrassing moment. And it showed me falling. And then they, they kept pausing it and rewinding it. So I fell about 25 times. And, and oh, the look on my face. I looked an absolute muppet. So that was the most embarrassing moment. And finally, what's your, your prize possession? Oh, my prize possession. Uh I, I can't even send my whistle because I, I, I lost it last year. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I refereed a charity game and for some reason it's it's gone missing. Uh, I have a couple of, of shirts uh, that from when I refed in Super League and, uh, you know, they, they were... I don't even know where they are. They're probably in a drawer somewhere <laughs> at the bottom. But I got a, a couple of referee of the year back in the late 90s and uh, that's what set my career off and, you know, they're still very cherished. Brilliant. Ian, thanks very much for no your time. Problem. Thanks for coming in. We'd love to have you in again very Anytime. soon as well. Um, we'll go on the hunt for another Smith for next week. You've been watching the Last Tackle podcast on loverubbleague.com. Please give us a subscribe on YouTube. Don't forget to comment and like all the videos on Facebook as well. And we'll see you next week.